Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Wall, and with me today is T3 Trading Group professional trader, Patrick Ha. Thanks so much for coming back uh, today, Pat. Of course. Thanks for having me back. All right. So you know the first question that I start with here, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right into that. Uh, how would you grade your week of trading so far on your typical school grading scale on A to an F, and why? Sure. I, I'd give myself an A minus, I think, this week. Um, it's been a pretty good week. It's been a good month. It's been a good, honestly, two months since the market bought it in November, which I'm sure, unless you're just sitting short on a short swing, everyone's been doing decently uh, so far. I'm the type that never really give myself an A plus because there's always more to improve on. There's always more size you can take. There's always trades you're going to miss, stuff like that. Um, and I probably missed a couple opportunities this past week or so, but overall, it's been pretty good, pretty consistent. I'm not breaking discipline, breaking rules or anything like that. So, um, yeah, overall, I'm happy with how I've been doing lately. Hmm. All right. Uh, so the market is on its longest win streak in six years. The S&P 500, you know, gained seven weeks in a row so far, longest since 2017. What's been your strategy when navigating this really hot uh, environment. Yeah, it's been crazy for sure. Um, mostly just following trend in. So you're always looking at different time frames, or at least you should be. That's what we're always doing. Um, following trend on the daily time frame, which has pretty much only been up or sideways since the bottom in late October, early November. Um, not trying to get to, oh, we've gone up too much too fast. So it's time to short. Uh, we haven't really quite seen, you know, full positioning, like full topping signs or anything like that yet. Although in the past couple of weeks, maybe we're starting to see some warning signs, um, but just following trends. So for example, you know, we, we had like a huge move up in November, I think towards the later half end of November, we started going sideways on the daily chart a little bit. Um, it was a huge move in November, but again, not going, oh, we went up too far too fast. So we have to go down markets correct through either price or time. So, you know, we go sideways for like a week or so, then names break out, pretty clean breakouts, um, you know, not sitting there going up again, too far, too fast, this breakout's going to fail, just nope, it's trading above the level, it's breaking out, you know, take the long, ride the long. Um, and then smaller time frame stuff, going counter trend on extreme extension where you're extended on the small time frame, a five minute, a 15 minute, as well as the daily. Um, if the daily is breaking out, you got to be careful with that, but mostly just following trend. And if honestly, we do a lot of technicals, we do fundamentals and stuff like that too. But if you're just a pure technical trader, you've probably been doing even better than me lately. Just again, following the chart, you see a breakout trades over the level trades. Well, keeps going up, you know, you can just ride the trend. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, so just not trying to overcomplicate what has been a really good rally. Um, it's been a good rally for a good reason honestly and there hasn't really been any signs again to totally end this rally or anything like that so yeah just following technicals and keeping it simple honestly which usually is the better thing to do in general uh, today we saw a pretty uh, significant pullback for the market down about a half one and a half percent for both the s p 500 and the nasdaq almost two percent uh, for small caps how do you characterize a day like today within the picture of the much larger rally we've had over the past two months? Yeah, so so I write like a weekly wisdom thing every week that you put out on LinkedIn. And the past two weeks, we've been really trying to, or at least I've been trying to focus on the VIX and the VVIX and that market getting a little bit, not oversold, but just pressed down a bit too much. Um, so today it was kind of all of that unfolding, I think anyway, maybe we're just right back up tomorrow. Um, and usually what happens on days like today is now, you know, CNBC or whoever tonight is going to pull any ne negative headline they can from at any point and be like, oh, this is why we sold. This is why we sold. And really, again, these past couple of weeks or so, like it was a really good November rally. First half of December was pretty good. Now. And I think last week I was looking at the VIX 11 level was like the big level where VIX mm -hmm. 11, one, the VIX hasn't been under 12 since I think 2020, maybe even late 2019. So the VIX is back to pre-COVID levels, like which before COVID happened, 
we were in a pure Goldilocks environment. Like everything was going pretty much as good as it could. Um, so then coming into today, starting, I want to say last week, it really even started like two weeks ago or so. We saw a little bit of VIX divergence where either the market was going up and the VIX wasn't really going down or the VVIX, which is the volatility of volatility, uh, started at the bottom out like a week before the VIX did. Then as of a week ago, specifically like two to three days ago, the VIX bottomed, but the market kept going up. And then to the point of um, like two days ago into the close yesterday, and then the first half of today was purely a VIX up, market up type of situation, which sometimes you see that's from extra put buying. Sometimes it's from just people chasing. I think this is definitely a forced buying environment, whether it's, you know, people you know, hedging their books or putting stuff on their books into year end or chasing performance. You see that happen a lot, especially when we're going strong into the end of the year. Um, but again, especially after you saw it really at the close yesterday and in the first half today, it was just market up, fall up. And that it, you can only diverge for so long in some aspects. Um, mm -hmm. In general, you know, things are correlated, things aren't perfectly correlated, but it's something we like to look at a lot. You know, you could just look at like a, you know, an AMD going up and an NVIDIA going down and sure they don't have to trade together, but they're probably only going to trade apart so long and stretch so much. So I think what happened today was really just kind of all that unraveling. It's, it's like a good three to four days, kept pressing up, kept pressing up, no correction, really no pullback, really, let alone in the bigger picture, we haven't really pulled back like at all. And then um again, yesterday at the close, market and the VIX spiked up both together. And then first half of today, um, VIX was really just kind of rallying with the market. If you look at the VIX, which um, bottomed actually last Friday in a pretty big way too, uh, that was like kind of a warning signal. So I think it's just all of that comes together and you can see that, you can see those divergences. It doesn't mean that things just have to automatically turn around right there and then when that shows up, but it's kind of like putting, you know, you put the gasoline down and then just someone has to spark the flame really. And then just one thing leads to another and you finally saw that happen today. So um, I don't want to say like we were looking for this to happen today, this afternoon, but as of a week or so ago, we were trying to be a bit more cautious saying, you know, you can buy, you can ride the trend up, but be careful. You know, I wouldn't start like a brand new huge long position or anything like that. Um, right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who's here with us live, um, I've put a comment in the chat on LinkedIn, just so you guys can see where that is. Put your questions there for Pat. Uh, we'll get to all of those in the second half of this event. Uh, so just go ahead and submit those as they come to mind for you. All right, so Pat, the catalyst for this most recent leg that we've had in this rally, you know, we're about two months into just a, a major uptrend for the market, uh, was last week's Fed meeting. Uh, and the dovish dot plot, of course, which showed plans for three rate cuts in 2024. Uh, the market is pricing in the first cut to happen in March. It's like over 60% of traders, I think, last time I looked, say March is going to be our first 25 basis point cut. Do you agree or disagree with that prediction and uh, why? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would say I partially agree with it. So okay. it's kind of like deja vu. I remember when you first started doing these series on LinkedIn, it was, I don't know, a year ago or something at this point, maybe mm -hmm. a little less, a little more, but it was the same scenario where the futures market had been pricing in Fed cuts to start. They were supposed to start this past September. And I remember it was like the <laughs> spring and we were saying that just, it really doesn't make any sense for, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. Um, so now we're kind of back to that scenario, although the Fed is basically saying that that's going to happen. Um, so whether it happens in March or not, I could see it happening in March. It could happen in March. So one, I think it could happen in March, depending on data that we see over the next couple of months, January, February, uh, and then March data. I'm not sure exactly what the date is for the March meeting, but if data starts to soften up even more or, um, inflation actually does drop to that 2%, you could start to see those cuts coming. And I get part of that argument is from real rates being actually decently positive now. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, real rates is rates minus inflation, or yeah, rates minus inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so if real rates are too high, you could see the Fed start to cut. So I, I could see it happening in March. Personally, I think it doesn't happen until May or June. However, 
even if it does happen in March, I don't think that's necessarily good for the market. Um, not that it's bad for the market, just the market's a forward-looking mechanism. So we're kind of pulling forward all that into right now that I think partially is why this rally is going on. And it's kind of like a chase rally force buying, as we were saying. So I don't want to say I this, you know, I guess if I had to agree or disagree, I would disagree. I wouldn't be shocked to see it. But I don't okay. think necessarily the market rockets higher because we get that. I mean, yeah. that's being priced in for sure. They've been trying to price that in for like a year now. So, mm -hmm. you know, once it actually comes, I mean, that'd be a pretty clear buy the rumor, sell the news type of thing, perhaps. And it depends why, too. If everything, again, is going super smoothly and it's just real rates are too high, inflation kept coming down, the market probably doesn't sell on that. It probably doesn't skyrocket higher either. Um, but if it happens because data is actually starting to soften, well, the market might actually already front run that and start selling yeah. off on that. And then the market, mm -hmm. you could see the market selling from the weak data as well. So, um, you know, we'll see. But I, I feel like when that question is asked, you know, you want to think like, oh, March, March rate cut. So market's going to go up in March. And I don't think it's going to be one or the other because I think we're yeah. pricing that in now. Yeah, I would definitely say we we're pricing in a lot of a lot of the dovishness uh, uh, now. Mm. Uh, the, your point about the real rates, uh, I, I think it was Derek last time he was on here was talking about this. The Fed can kind of get some free rate cuts because of how high real rates have been, uh, right. you know, where it doesn't really have the negative impact, recessionary impact on the economy. Uh, or the, or sorry, the stimulate, stimulating impact on the economy that the Fed doesn't want to see uh, because rates have gotten so high that there's this like this disconnect between, you know, where the Fed funds rate is sitting and where the real rates are kind of sitting. Can you explain that phenomenon a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so basically, again, real rates is just rates minus inflation. So if Fed funds are 5.5 now and inflation is say 3% percent now then your actual real rate is 2.5 mm -hmm. percent so the fed uses rate cuts and rate hikes um as bullets if you will for either tightening or stimu uh, stimulating as you said mm -hmm. so if we if everything's going smoothly and we cut simply because um you know, again, it's just like Goldilocks environment and everything's going well and real rates are just too high. They could start to cut because that would put bullets in their tank for possible hikes if they get too complacent and then inflation doesn't come, either doesn't come down as much or, mm -hmm. you know, starts to actually go back up, which this inflation was pretty much a V top. I was kind of surprised by how it, yeah. you know, skyrocketed up and then it's pretty much been down, down, down ever since. So theoretically, that could give them room to hike back up and start tightening back up forcibly if we do run ahead of ourselves a little bit too much and you start to see CPI actually uptick a couple months in a row, for example. Um, and then it's the flip, too, when they're hiking rates. Rate cuts are, I guess, bullets in the tank, if you will, for stimulating or easing financial policy, if you will. Um, in case you know things are getting too tight and people are panicking and everything like that so if they don't cut and data gets worse and markets get worse but they don't really have as much room to like they're not going to want to cut they're not going to want to raise they're going to be in a trickier spot so they'd rather try to forward look a little bit even though for the most part the fed seems to anticipate more than react um but they just they want to have room which i feel like Overall, they've done a pretty good job with that. So they want to have room to cut more if they need to, but tighten more if they need to as well. Um, and they're probably, you know, they've been in wait and see mode for the past few months now, and they'll probably be doing the same because they're probably saying, you know, they're probably pretty happy with themselves and saying like, wow, we kind of nailed this. I can't believe that. And I feel like a lot of people can't believe it either. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yep, the Fed, I mean, arguably has done exactly what they were supposed to do. Uh, maybe they started yeah. a little late that that can be discussed uh but it's gone right. to plan i would say okay it is at the end of wednesday so we're like halfway well, a little more than halfway through this week you have two trading days left let's look back uh, tell me about the best trade you've had this week and what made it go well um if you want to show charts you can if you don't want to you don't have to um i never made you a 
post on this. Yeah, it's, I probably won't show charts just because I have some sensitive information on my screen. And I'll okay, have no big deal. But um, <laughs> yeah, sure. But so just talk us through the trade. You know why you got into it, and then how you navigated, and why it went. Yeah. Out. So I didn't really have any like home run trades this week or anything, um, but I wasn't hitting for home runs, I guess. So, okay. you know, that's part of the discipline and good trading and stuff like that. Um, I had a good short, I guess, today in Tesla uh, in front of the 260 level, which was just slight daily. So like that short was slight daily extension. The actual entry point on the small time frame was five, 15 minute uh, small time frame extension, intraday extension just looking for that to a trace with going into today. Again, yesterday, we were seeing VIX and market up a little bit the past few days. And then yesterday, specifically at the close, the last 10 minutes was like a pure market spike, VIX spike, um, kind of like a warning sign for, you know, maybe something's coming. It doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. Could be tomorrow afternoon, could be two, three, four days out from now, something like that. But kind of knowing that, be ready for the short, but don't just sit in the short while things just grind up against you. I've done that in the past. It's terrible. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just, you know, it's it's a good way to maybe make a little money and lose some years of your life sitting through all that. Um, so for the Tesla short today, uh, again, small time frame extension, some daily extension as well. The daily wasn't too extended, but if you look at a chart of Tesla, it's mostly sideways over the past two months or so. Whereas the Qs and some of those other uh, Mag Seven names, I guess, is like the new Fang term everyone uses. The Mag Seven, yeah. yeah. Um, those have been running pretty well from you know bottom left corner of your screen to upper right in like a clear uptrend. Mm -hmm. Whereas Tesla's been lagging the Qs a little bit. So on the one hand, you could say, well, Tesla's the next to go, and on the other hand, you could say it was relatively weak. Um, and it was honestly just a small time frame trade that. And I ended up catching like almost a full move down in Tesla today. Um, and that's just, again, just following the rules, staying disciplined. Um, I think it took me two to three tries actually as well, which I'll speak on that later because I think you have another question about improving trades and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just being able to catch the full move on a decent entry. Um, and yeah, yeah, that was it really. All right. And then let's look at the the other side of that to talk about the worst trade uh, you've had this week and uh, what made it go wrong. Yeah, my worst trade was probably, again, not, I wasn't shooting for home runs, but I've also been staying disciplined. So I didn't have like a huge loser or anything. And I haven't had a huge loser in a little bit. Um, I did lose money trying to short a firm today, which ended up working out, but I was out and down on it before that ended up happening. Um, looking back, so a firm was in play yesterday. They came out with news that apparently they're going to add um, a firm to Walmart self-checkout. Mm -hmm. So you can, in like 4,500 locations, so you can go to Walmart, get your groceries now and pay for it later, hopefully. At least that's what the firm's hoping you do. Um, mm -hmm. But so because it was in play yesterday, I it probably, looking back, wasn't really something good to go after, given that it was still kind of fresh news. There's probably still momentum buyers there. And then honestly, I was just too tight with too much size in it as well. Looking back, I probably should have been a little bit looser, a little smaller size, knowing that a firm is up from like 20 to 50 in two months or something crazy. Um, it can move a lot. There's a lot of downside room there. There's also upside room. It's a, you know, it's a momentum name. That's why when it goes from 20 to 40, you know, you don't want to say it's up too much too fast because if that's like another good example of a chart, um, a firm, a lot of those crypto names, which a lot of people look at, they've been very clean trends, like the Coinbase, which has basically gone parabolic. The actual chart's been very clean, um, you know, just either basically up sideways, up sideways. So with the firm being in play yesterday, still kind of some talk about it today. Um, it probably just wasn't a good one to focus on. And then because I was doing that, I ended up missing a short on JP Morgan today, which was much more extended on the daily chart to the upside, wasn't really in play. Um, some of the other banks looked a little tired and I was kind of focused on that. And I ended up missing that because I was doing this other trade, which isn't a great excuse, but um, 
Yeah. So one shorting a firm and losing, being a little too tight, probably not the name to go after. And then because of that opportunity cost is always a thing as well that mm -hmm. people don't always talk about, but, um, you know, it's true. And that's the same thing with, if you're just sitting shorting spy, like every day and you're just sitting in a swing short and you're not capturing anything else. Cause you're too focused on that. Even mm -hmm. if you end up making some money, you know, two, three weeks later, whatever, you're going to miss opportunity costs and some of this other momentum stuff. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's, you know, whatever it is, what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, really good point. All right. Um, how would you describe the current market sentiment and action? Yeah, so, uh, market is bullish. Yeah. The most obvious <laughs> statement ever, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so. The, the sentiment's really bullish right now. Um, positioning, some of the positioning indicators that we like to look at, one of my favorites comes from Bank of America. Um, Michael Hartnett, I believe is the guy's name, it's the Bank of America uh, bull bear indicator, which focuses a lot on bigger, bigger picture positioning um, through different asset flows and stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. been getting to the second half of the meter, if you will. So more on the full side but it's not really close to being full um at the same time there's a lot of laggards that still could have room to go iwm small caps has been a focus for many um to the point where everyone you know everyone kind of thinks small caps are, can be bullish and can run um <laughs> they already did run in a huge way i think last week or either last week or the past month was like a historic 52 week low to 52 week high for IWM. It was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, how, how is market sentiment right now? It's bullish. I think we're more in a forced flow type of environment right now, though, where, you know, everyone's bullish stocks are doing well. Everyone can see things are trending up. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to take a pause because again, it's year end. Um, you have people dressing their books up to add exposure to winners, stuff like that. Um, so, so it's, it's a little tricky right now. Cause again, like, so the way I like to think and look at markets is not just like do the opposite of whatever looks obvious, but kind of mm -hmm. looking at charts, looking at sentiment, seeing what other people see, hearing what other people are talking about, and then kind of thinking, okay, well, how does the market resolve this all rationally while also bringing max pain to everyone which the market really likes to do that's like mm -hmm. kind of what it's best at so right now it, you know it's a little tricky like you're looking at the charts the market's up a lot sentiment's bullish everyone knows that everyone can see that it's very obvious um which we're we're actually talking about that as a team in like the beginning of november so we're after that november move doesn't, you know, just because we're up a lot really fast doesn't mean we have to come back down right away, right? right. Um, you know, what would be max pain? Probably just further upside. No one, you know, people don't think we can go up more because we went up so fast. People don't want it to go up more because we went up so fast and they might have missed out. Um, they might have missed out. They might have been short. They might have sold their longs down lower. Now they have to chase back in, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it kind of still, even after today's move, lower it still kind of feels like that like probably no one wants the market to go up more but that's probably because they want to buy more lower before it goes back up so therefore it would make sense for the market to kind of just keep pressing that um so you know sentiment's bullish market's bullish that's really obvious though um you know, whether or not this leads to kind of like a blow off -y top, which I, I don't think that was today, really. Um, mm -mm. That would be more of like a probably one, two to three week move where it just gets really crazy. Um, we'll see. So, yeah, thing, things are good. Um, things are good for now. For now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> for now. All right. What stocks yeah. or sectors are you bullish on right now and why? So... Yeah, I was trying to think on this earlier, um, and I was trying to look through different sectors. I, I really don't want to say IWM and small caps because that's what pretty much everyone that comes on TV says these mm -hmm. days. Um, and it makes sense. Like, I don't disagree with that. I do agree with that. Um, but I guess just being a little more specific, I'd probably say 
for next year, maybe for the first half of next year, energy and healthcare. Um, energy has been basing out decently. If you look at like XLE or something like that, it's been basing out okay. Um, hasn't really been downtrending, starting to form a base. Oil seems to be trying to find a bit of a floor in like the, the 60s area. And there's still a lot of geopolitical tension and risk out there, which, you know, for better or for worse, the market seems to always these days kind of freak out about things for like a week or two. And then it becomes old news, even though it's not old news. Obviously, all that stuff's very important. Um, but there's, you know, there hasn't been any resolutions in any of that really. So mm -hmm. theoretically, oil could come back up um, if anything gets worse. Hopefully it doesn't. But honestly, just the chart in general, energy starting to base out of it. Nat natural gas, too. I, I don't own any nat gas, um, but I'm surprised that it's still this low. I remember we were looking at nat gas as a team in like the spring, which it was around these levels, might have even been a little higher. Um, and some of us were looking at buying it. We caught like a little trade, but it was coming into the summer. Seasonality wasn't right. Um, but now it's the winter. You yeah, know? so now seasonality is theoretically right. <laughs> you think there should be more demand for that um mm -hmm. i know the us has been oversupplied for a while with that as well but that's just like a little tidbit in energy obviously oil moves things a lot more um the chevron hess deal was like a massive massive deal that got announced a month ago or so mm -hmm. um that caused chevron to turn their buyback off i would assume in the next two to three months that they're able to turn that back on and hopefully close that out. Uh, so that should help energy as well. Um, and then the other sector, healthcare, uh, if you look at like XLV as the healthcare ticker, uh, that's been more or less sideways for quite a long time now, like in a big, big picture, it's been a, has a big sideways range going on. Um, so it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been lagging, it hasn't been downtrending and healthcare in general is pretty mixed. There's big laggards like Pfizer in there, there's big winners like Eli Lilly in there. But overall, healthcare has been fairly flat. And as they say, you know, the longer the base, the bigger the race, the bigger the breakout. Um, so I feel like that could see upside, one, because the technicals look okay. And then, you know, MAG 7's up so much. Do you really want to chase that? Maybe. Um, but arguably, healthcare, like there's a good argument that healthcare is both defensive and growthy as well, depending on what stocks you're looking at in there. But I feel like you could see healthcare outperform um, like the first half of the next year. And then probably energy too. Um, I feel like you could see that outperform. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't. It, again, a lot of geopolitical stuff going on. So we'll see with that. But I could see that as well, um, especially in like a down market. I could see energy being up, healthcare being down, not as much, um, stuff like that. Yeah. All right. And then uh, what do you feeling more bearish about me. You might not be a bear kind of on anything. I don't think most people are currently, uh, but what are you yeah. feeling less strong about uh, currently? <laughs> yeah, less, I would say less bullish on MAG7, definitely not bearish um, mm -hmm. and probably just less bullish on the market in general, which the MAG7, you know, isn't all the market, but it is a lot of the market at this point. Yeah. Um, and that's just that goes back to the Fed's uh, talk that we were just speaking about a few moments ago, where the market, like everything's Goldilocks right now, everything's going really well. The market's pricing that in. It, you know, I don't want to say it has priced it in, but it's working on pricing that in. Um, so it's hard to be bearish and look right now when everything's going well, and then you know some random event happens two months out and you know all the bears are like look i told you stocks were going to go down but they're not they're probably not calling that exact event that's going to happen and they're definitely not calling the exact date or week or anything that it's going to happen um so yeah I, I wouldn't say i'm really bearish on anything but probably just less bullish on those bigger names but again, that's like that's like another thing that kind of feels obvious and looks obvious at the same time. And I really don't like focusing on things that are obvious to everyone. Um, so it, it's a little tricky. I think it's I think overall you can still be bullish, but 
just be a little careful. Oh, I did write, um, I'm seeing now, I wrote buy now, pay later too, as well, just because okay. the stocks are crazy and uh -huh. it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. Like, I don't know, you can go to Walmart and, you know, you can get your groceries now and pay later. And it just feels like these companies are banking on a group of people that you probably like a really, don't want to bank on, you know, a really like, predatory credit environment. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I would be surprised a year from now if buy now, pay later is just you know still perfect and puppies and rainbows is the phrase that people use for hmm. you know when everything's perfect, but it's a little too perfect, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, before we uh, reflect on this year and look ahead to the future, we have lots of audience questions. So let's get to some of those or well, we'll get to all of them. Um, so our first comes from Derek, uh, who is of course the senior trader for T3 Trading Group. You work alongside him every single day in the ProDesk virtual trading floor. Uh, so he said, thanks for all your insights and all your valuable contributions to the T3 team. What big picture signals are you looking for to look the other way for the market? The big picture signals that I would look for for the other way to the market would be either broader VIX divergence where the market keeps grinding higher, not accelerating, but grinding higher, and the VIX bases out. And I'm not talking like a couple of days, I'm talking a month, you know, m multiple weeks. Um, where you know, you know again this like 12 to 11 area on the vix that 11 is a huge level 11 was resistance on the vix back in like 2017 like way 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 back now at this point um it, we got over that in i want to say 2018 something like that and then 11 was support for a really long time mm -hmm. so we almost got back to that level i could see the market grinding higher and the vix spacing out and the VIX basically just kind of waiting for something to happen, if you will. It's probably not the right phrase to use. Um, or a blow off top where we have seen that happen before. We haven't had it in a while. The two that come to mind for me are July after, I think it was July after the COVID bottom. I'm not sure if it was that year or the year after. But I know it was July after the COVID bottom, we had a blow off top and it was the same thing. The VIX in the market went up, but it wasn't like 30 minutes of it. It was four to five days of it where we finally broke and yet we had a move like we saw this afternoon. Um, and the other one was 20, uh, Feb 2018, which was the XIV implosion. Mm -hmm. And that product helped exacerbate that scenario, I guess, if you will. Um, but yeah, just something where we we like really accelerate to the upside and you know everything is good and all you know there's just all good news there's no bad news nothing can go wrong and we go up and up and up and that's where we probably wouldn't see the vix base out i like i think if the market grinded higher the vix would just base but if the market really accelerated higher and i'm talking like s p 5200 something like that like real like a lot higher still um mm -hmm. that would be arguably pulling that would be like really pricing in a perfect year for next year right away and then we could see a turn lower but i still i still think it's hard to argue for like a return to a bear market or anything like that i think the market going forward is just going to be choppier um and even if we end up grinding higher i just i don't think it's going to be these you know up sideways, up sideways, up sideways charts. You're probably going to get more volatility in there. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Next question comes from Dylan. He said, what have been a few of your favorite recent catalysts for trades in this recent uptrend? What plays are you seeing the most success? Yeah, sure. Uh, catalysts for trades. Um, I mean, so it's been a chase on market. So really anything that's in play has been doing well and that mm -hmm. can be a day-to-day -day basis thing so like a firm yesterday was in play um i think meta was in play a couple days ago you know the, the these days and weeks fly by now so i'm trying to think of like the exact <laughs> days of what was in play per se um yeah. but anything that has any type of news really like we're the animal spirits are back that's something we've been talking about the past mm -hmm. couple of weeks or so it's, at least that's what it feels like 
um i think it was like two weeks ago you saw a gamestop and amc rally during the day for <laughs> no reason and then you start to see like wish.com and tupperware and just these like it gets to the point where it's like all right what can we buy that has a short float or what can we buy that hasn't rallied like buy anything and everything um mm -hmm. so anything that's in play that you have a little bit of an edge on or just daily charts with like clean breakouts up until that october november bottom it was so hard almost impossible to get like a real clean breakout every breakout either ended up failing the next day or even that day you'd spike up and then you wouldn't really go and you'd end up failing back lower and now breakouts are working and they're working pretty well and you know you see just the queues grinding up and then you look at like apple and maybe apple had an inside day yesterday where the candle was inside the prior day's candle or you know apple's just or like meta um 340 i think was one we caught earlier this week where meta just gets a little you know has an up move gets tight in front of this big level it's tight for a couple of days maybe it bumps its head up against it a couple of times or so and then it goes and breakouts are working now and you got to just be able to adapt over time when the market changes because that's what always happens and if you're too scarred from say four or five months ago where you know breakouts aren't working and you just get to the point where breakouts are never going to work again that's when they finally start to work um and then you end up missing out on them right so um yeah honestly mostly either stuff that's in play or just clean technicals because that's what's been working since that november bottom now we're almost two months into that so it probably won't work too much longer but maybe another month or so um and then things will probably get a little tricky again Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Uh, Ryan asked, uh, he, or he said, curious why NVIDIA seems so stuck in place since earnings. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so that I, f that, I feel like that's a good example of what we might see for the broader markets okay. going into the second half of next year, where like NVIDIA has been doing really well. Their earnings reports have been great. Um, there's nothing really wrong going on there per se. I do think there was some insider selling last month, but you know, whatever. Um, but just just because something can't go up anymore doesn't mean it has to come down. But just because, but at the same time, when everything is priced in really well, you know, who's left to buy? I guess is the question that might arise for the broader market in general too over the next month or two where positioning isn't quite full yet, but we might get to that point and that's what it would be and more of like a grindy top where it's just like, who's left to buy here? So with NVIDIA, I don't think there's anything wrong with it per se, but that's like, that's a sign to look for when something should happen and it doesn't happen, that could be a sign for the other way. So for NVIDIA today, which actually ended up selling off decently, I think some people were looking at NVIDIA 500, today mm -hmm. um and i'm sure yesterday and the day before as well the video this you know big 500 level uh there's a lot of call options there i'm sure it's a huge strike price you know nice big round number uh, but you know market is going up nvidia is a leader it's a great company nvidia should go up nvidia should break out and it doesn't two days ago and it doesn't yesterday and then even this morning it can't really go this morning when the market's going higher and you know something that should happen doesn't happen it can be a sign for the other way um so i don't have like a perfect answer for why nvidia might be lagging i don't think it's because it's bad news or anything it might just be buyer exhaustion simply and nvidia was you know i forget exactly when it bottomed i think january um but it was 140 in january um, yeah <laughs> so the things what tripled more than tripled um just because it's up a lot doesn't mean it has to come down but you know it's it pretty keep, keep going right up either. <laughs> right yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah okay uh ian said how many on how many trades can you focus on a specific day given that there are plenty of good picks to choose from yeah that's a good question it depends on the setup if it's just like an intraday extension trade that i wasn't planning you know some trades i planned before some trades i plan not like on the spot per se but they come to me based on 
you know, how the market's moving, how extended we are, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I might be looking to short SPY today, but I might be looking to do it off the open or at 10 or in the middle of the day, depending on what signal is there for when it comes or it might not come at all. And therefore, I might just not do it or might miss it. Um, so I'm trying to think of things. So re repeat the question again. Yeah. Um, on how many trades can you focus on a specific? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. But there are plenty. So, of so one, like always have your trade what you're going to do with it before you're getting into it. And sometimes yeah. I'll still come up with that on the spot. Um, there's not an exact number. Sometimes one is enough, depending if things are going crazy. Um, and sometimes it could be four to five different ones. It's probably not going to be much more than five for me. Um, I don't think that's a strict, you know, cut off for that. Anyone should abide by. That's not something I abide by per se, but it depends on the setup, honestly, at the end of the day. So if I make, you know, a thousand dollars in one trade and one name and someone else makes $500 in 10 trades and 10 names, well, you know, that person traded all this stock and all these names and everything like that. But at the end of the day, I still did better per se, yeah. um, based on trading. So it's not really like what I can or can't handle per se. It's just that like you don't really need it um you know if you have one setup and the conviction's there then take bigger size in that and go with that um mm -hmm. if you know you have multiple things that might be setting up might be giving you signals you could try a couple things with smaller sizes and then ideally you have good risk reward on them and if two out of three don't work but one out of three does work and your risk reward profile is set up right you should still get paid on that at the end of it um so yeah, so you know it's not an exact number. It really does depend on the setup. Um, but I am a true believer that you don't need to focus on a ton and like trade everything. Um, mm -hmm. When the setup is there, take the setup. I mean that like as a trader, that's your job. At the end of the day, you know, take the setup when it's there. But um, you know, it, I, again, it, you don't need a ton really. It, you need a ton of conviction, but you don't need a ton of different names. Um, so, you know, you don't, you don't have to over-focus on a lot, um, but you do have to focus all the time. So yeah, it depends really. If, ev you know, if everything's going to sell, I don't feel the need, you know, I, I am fine shorting Qs or shorting Tesla. I don't feel the need to short Apple and Google and NVIDIA and AMD and, you know, short like everything because I can just size up in one thing. Um, Whereas if, you know, I'm looking at different sectors and different things that are in play, depending on what the news is that morning or anything like that, then um, I might take smaller sizes and different stuff. But um, yeah, it's all, it's risk reward, probability, conviction. That's it really. Great. Okay. A Tate said, do you think VVIX needs to put in a new low for SPY to make new all-time highs? Or can the market make new highs with VIX products off of these year lows? The market, that, so that's a, that'd be something good to look for. Um, okay. The market can definitely make new highs without those making new lows. And that would be another warning signal where the market, that'd be like kind of a possible grindy top where the market just grinds to new highs, grinds to new highs. Uh, that's kind of what the Dow is doing right now. The Dow is at yeah. all time highs and has been making new highs, I think every day this week, um, including today even. So yeah, I think the market hit a high before before the yeah definitely yeah. so you definitely could see a market new high and vix or vvix not new low and that would be another diversion signal where you know again markets making new highs the vix probably should be making or close to new lows and if it's not that could be a warning signal if uh -huh. you see and then you could see even the market and the market make new highs the vix make new lows but the vvix not make new lows um that could be another warning signal as well if you see the VVIX and the VIX new lows and market new highs, that could be the more blow off top where the VIX actually does go 11, even sub 11 with a 10 handle, which I couldn't even tell you what year we saw a 10 handle in VIX, probably like 2016, 15, something like that. Um, 
and then and, and then it's just it's that gets to the point where the vix low is like nine something like that like it doesn't really go much lower than that um so that would be more of like a blow off top but that's a good question tate shout out to tate and um yeah that'd be something to look for definitely is um if the market does grindy make new highs but the vix base is out and maybe the vix is up trending a little bit on the daily chart you know that's something where it's just something's not right here this you know this is going to resolve one way or the other so hmm. okay uh dimitri said how big a factor do you think market dynamics i.e sentiment options positioning cta vol targeting positioning etc is in the current market environment are they more or less of a factor than the past lastly some are jokingly calling today the great sell-off or bear market of 2023 uh, do you think those dynamics played a role today and where can we learn more about them? Yeah, so flows, positioning, super important. It's probably the most important thing to watch. Um, you know, Derek always likes to joke when <laughs> someone asks why something went up, um, you know, more buyers and sellers will be like the joking answer or something went down, more sellers than buyers. But that's the truth at the end of the day. Um, yeah. You know, if there was an equal amount of buyers and sellers, it would just be flat all day. So net, you know, things don't go straight up or straight down, but net, net, if you're up, you had more buyers and sellers. That's why people paid up for the price and the price went up. Um, so it's something super important that we watch. Zero DTE is obviously very important these days. It's starting to definitely become a little bit mainstream um, where you got like CNBC talking about it and stuff like that. And I know there was chatter about some big zero DTE trade today. And I think it was VIX calls that possibly triggered the sell off. But I don't think that one trade made all that happen today. I feel like just like we said with the gasoline and someone has to just light the match it was lining up it just it could have been this morning it could have been this afternoon it could have been tomorrow it could have been next week where you're getting like market up volatility up it's looking you know people are looking for a reason or the robots or whatever whatever they're looking for a reason and then you see that trade come in and that's enough to you know make the vix jump make markets tick down a little bit and that can sometimes trigger stops. And then those stops that are triggering and pushing things down will trigger more stops. And then, you know, that you get like these momentum robots trading during the day that might be stopping each other out. And then if you, you break yesterday's low, that might be stopping some momentum daily players out and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, super, super important, more important. I don't want to say more important than ever. Um, I just think the dynamics of how this stuff is moved, the money is moved around throughout the day has changed. Yeah. I know that last year, 2022, was I believe the first year ever where options volume was more than equities volume, net net. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably only going to increase. And it makes sense. I mean, you know, it's less risky to buy a call than it is to buy stock and everything like that. Um, in terms of learning about it, honestly, when I used to ask people, like I have some older friends that work on the street. When I used to ask them questions, they tell me to Google it. Um, and that's what I would do. <laughs> so th there's infinite sources out there, infinite. Um, it's all out there. And it's not, you know, one equal, it's not black and white. It's not, you know, these zero DTEs move the market because the market's huge. You have so much money moving around, a lot of different strategies, a lot of different players. Um, if you have some just massive fund buying a name up all day, it doesn't really matter how much put buying is going on in that because, you know, they're just going to drive it up. Um, so, you know, whether you want to learn about VIX versus VVIX or whether you want to want to learn about zero DTEs, or how the impact of options buying and selling affects the underlying equity. Um, there's a lot of different sources for it. I we could talk all night about it if we like really got into it. Um, but yeah, just uh, just research. And honestly, that's how I've learned pretty much everything is um, just research. So great. All right, Leif said, would you please touch on the new negative gamma environment that we are entering? and how you think that plays out going into 2024. So 
there is a note out this morning arguing that we may possibly be in a negative gamma environment right now after the December options expiration, which took place last Friday, and I believe was a record setting options expiration, something like $5 trillion with a T um, expired in options. Mm -hmm. So gamma, I mean, so like now we're, you know, starting to talk about gamma and everything and gamma is not something to explain in 30 seconds per se, but <laughs> basically positive gamma um dealers are long they're selling on up moves buying on down moves negative gamma dealers tend to be either short or underwater or just looser in general they're doing the opposite they're buying on the way up and selling on the way down so usually you see this around options expiration a lot especially the big ones which um september and december i think are the two biggest uh this december was massive you the market will get really tight around that slash into that options expiration and then once that expires you get some looseness in the market mm -hmm. um that's something you know going back to the obvious and everyone looking at the obvious and talking about the obvious everyone knows that an options expiration is coming up so people will say oh options expiration is coming up so the market will sell next week after that all expires and sometimes you'll see the market sell that week into it because it'll be front run um so um yeah i mean yeah that's um so so like you know i'm trying to like think of how to simply explain a gamma environment and a gamma flip right now so now that options that options expiration is over markets should be a little bit looser and arguably into negative gamma territory now that all that has expired so now what you're getting is a looser market with a possible spot up vol up market as well and that can enhance moves either direction so okay. we could see like that could help be the catalyst for a blow off top that comes possibly in january or early february something like that um and that can also mean the movements that we saw today this afternoon where we get like a real downside intraday extension it feels like forever since we've gotten real downside intraday extension honestly even back in like that october low we didn't see anything too crazy like that um so what does that mean going forward now again bit looser market some of those bigger whole numbers like nvidia 500 um tesla 250 was another one those might not act like as hard of support or resistance now um and then again just you can see markets break up or break down in a way that they weren't able to before this options expiration and now people are focused on the january expiration which isn't as big um, but you do get some january flows as well um, that could hinder things a little bit so you know for, for anyone that's like a little confused out there just again you know google search gamma positive gamma negative gamma um read up about the different flows everything like that um it's not simple you know it, it's not simple I'm, I'm still learning about this stuff myself i learn about it every day i try to read about it every day so um yeah yeah and i think a lot of market participants out there also are starting to catch on to some of this stuff and how important it really is yeah yeah all right our last audience question is from joseph he wants to know if you're on a vtf uh, the answer is yes uh, for everyone who's maybe doesn't know what vtf is virtual trading floor pat's part of the pro desk virtual trading floor through t3 live so he wanted to know which one uh so there's your answer pro desk talk about your role within pro desk and what you do there every day sure my role in pro desk i would say is i'm like the information guy um mm -hmm. if you will so a typical day in the pro desk is we all people log in there anytime from you know 4 a.m or whatever i'm definitely not logging in there at 4 a.m but usually around 7 30 or so uh i'm putting all the pre-market news in there that i find to be important per se doesn't mean i'm going to trade that name or anything like that but there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that comes out a lot of you know random biotech news and stuff like that i'm not in there just you know blindly sharing every headline but i'm trying to pick and choose what might be in play that day what looks like it's moving the most um 
So, you know, pre-market preparation, then usually Derek leads the morning meeting around 9 a.m. or so. Uh, market opens, we're active in there all day, looking for news headlines, looking at option order flow, um, anything really that can give us an edge. And I've, again, just, you know, knowing where to find this stuff, looking for it is just simply me either Google searching or searching on Twitter, like, you know, when did this come out? Where did this come out? Stuff like that. And then over time, you start to piece together different sources of information that can help you um, help bring an edge to you throughout the day. So I like to think of myself, I guess, as the information guy. Um, you know, I take I try to take in a lot of information. And if I don't know something, I probably can figure it out or look for the answer for you. Um, so and then that helps support other people who are a bit more active in trading in there. And, you know, sometimes I might bring information into the room and I'm, you know, trying busy handling other stuff. And then someone calls out a trade based on that information. And then I might take that trade with them. And it all syncs together for what I think is a pretty good team environment. Yeah. Great. All right. We are butting up on the end here, but I want to get these two questions in because uh, I think they're, they're important. So, uh, you know, we're only a week and a half left of this year. So let's reflect back on 2023, arguably a very uh, interesting year for the market. I, it feels like we've gone through four totally different markets in 2023. Yeah as one For year sure. uh, which has been super interesting so what has been the biggest lesson that you learned trading this year um yeah let's see what i wrote here so i think overall my biggest lesson slash what I want to do better on is not a new lesson for me but okay. it's sticking with one sticking with the game plan and mm -hmm. two, keeping losses small, but that kind of ties in together. Um, just sticking with the game plan. All my biggest losses, including this year slash pretty much throughout my professional trading career, um, have been holding and averaging into losers. But every time I've done that, I've done that in a way where you know, I'm not necessarily avoiding my stop. Sometimes on swings, the stop isn't necessarily a level, but it's, you know, kind of you know, partially based on a level, partially based on a dollar amount, partially based on the sentiment and the market and, you know, what's going on around that name, what should happen if that doesn't happen. And that means this probably happens. And all my biggest losers are always just not wanting to take it off not wanting to accept that I was wrong, whatever it was, or just giving it a little more and a little more. And, you know, something that I easily could have been down a few hundred in turns into a few thousand. And it, it's just like a scenario that it's just, it's not sustainable. Um, I've been better about not doing that this year, but it definitely still happens to me a couple of times. Um, and I think I wrote down in all caps for like, you had another question about my trading goals. Um, mm -hmm. No outsized losses, um, yeah. cut the losers and retry it. And that's something I've been improving on, I think in the second half of this year, and I'm focused on for next year as well, because your if your risk reward, so going back to just like the idea of a trade, you gotta know what the trade is. You gotta know when you're getting, you gotta know when, where and why, where you're getting in, where you're taking your stop and where your targets are. You gotta know why you're taking the trade, you know, whether it's in play or you think the market's going up or whatever. Um, and then you gotta have an idea of when. So if it's a just a day trade, you know, is this happening in the next five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour? If it's a swing trade, is this happening in the next week or month or, you know, quarter or something like that? Um, and then, once you know all that, therefore you can analyze what your risk reward is. And if you're risking one to make five, if you're risking one to make 10, you can take that one loss and get back in that trade, um, you know, three, four times plus. And once it finally works and you just follow that risk reward game plan, you'll still end up getting paid on that. And I'm not emphasizing to uh, like fight stocks or anything, like definitely don't do that. But um if so like 
a, a stop, a stop loss. The what's the idea behind a stop loss? If you're stopping out of something, th theoretically, this is like theory, but theoretically, you should flip your trade every time you get stopped out of something. Definitely don't actually do that. But you know, if you're long something and you're taking a stop on the way down, why are you stopping out? Because it's breaking that level and it's going to go lower. Well, if it's breaking that level, going to go lower. Why don't you flip short, right? So say you're getting like pushed out of something in a little bit and you know hopefully you don't have too much size on or whatever but again that risk reward profile risk one to make three risk one to make four risk one to make whatever x um it stops you out okay it stopped me out therefore it should go the other way and then if it doesn't well maybe that's a shakeout and you can try it again um you know don't short in front of 50 have it break 50 and then short at 51 and 52 and 53. No, but short in front of 50, have it break 50. It trades up to 50 and a half, comes back under 50. You could try it again. And if you're risking 50 cents and you think the name can fall five points, you can try that a couple of times and still get paid on it. Um, so that's been something I've been working on the second half of this year. And honestly, it's been going pretty well. Um, and again, just based off that concept of stops, it's good risk reward. Where you know, if you're risk, if you're risking one to make one, you can't do that. But you should, probably shouldn't be doing that in trading in general. Um, so if your risk reward's good, you can try it a couple times. Um, sometimes you don't have to try it a couple times, but sometimes, honestly, you do because uh, you get shaken out and stuff like that. But yeah, having good risk reward profile and respecting your levels and that's it because at the end of the day all those big outsized losers that i had if i just took that initial annoying loss that i was too stubborn about to take um i'd be up even more this year right um, so yeah yeah love it great thank you so much for coming back on today pat uh for everyone who's still with us live i'm putting a comment in the chat or in the the chat but the comments uh, for next week's event josh leffler will be back for the final uh conversations with the pro trader of 2023 uh before we kick off 2024 which i think is going to be an interesting year uh, for the market Definitely. for the economy for the fed for everyone so uh, thank you and it's an election year so that'll and be fun yeah. yes all right uh have a great rest of your week trading and a great rest of your 2023 Yes, happy holidays. Thank you for having me.